So I want to quickly give you all an update concerning the prison ministry. It was the fifth Saturday, and uh, it was open, and we had the opportunity. Chaplain contacted the pastor, and, and we said, yeah, we'll, we'll go. You know, we don't ever want to miss an opportunity. And so uh, we went out there, and Brother War and I, and we had two separate services. You know, in the cottages, you have to be careful where, how you mix and integrate who comes because um, the gang affiliations and things of that nature and you don't want things getting you know out of control so I had two separate kind of services in in the first service you know you know I, um, we we fellowshiped with them talked a little one-on-one -on -one with them ate with them and then um, I, I brought a 10-15 minute word and then I, I really felt the Holy Ghost because you're naive if you're in a place like that and you think every one of those offenders, every one of those, you know, felons are just paying attention and they want God and they really are great, happy that you're there. You know, that's naive. And so I made this statement. I said, I, I gave the altar call and I said, I don't want none of y'all coming up here unless you're serious. I said, don't look at chaplain. Don't look at your friends or whatever. I said, if you're serious, come up. I said, if you're not, stay where you at. Nobody came. I said, I said, hallelujah. I said, guards, take them out. Take them back. And then so a couple of them came to the side and they said, it's peer pressure. I didn't really want it. So I had a little separate, really intimate time with about four or five of them, praying with them, laying hands on them. And it was really, really powerful. And I, I really thank God for it. And then the second service was the same thing. I did the exact same thing, except for I was familiar with some of these kids that were in there you know I've built a little bit of a relationship and they recognized me and as soon as I gave the altar call like five or six of them flooded up kind of shocked me a little bit and then there was this one guy his name was Wilson yeah Wilson me and Wilson gonna have some conversations here and he kept asking Wilson he kept asking how do you know God's real what's this new birth what's this baptism in Jesus name what's this what's that how do you know God's real how do you know this he's invisible and I'm engaged with him he's got my undivided attention and he's got four or five people around him and they're like get him Wilson we want to know too you know and it's like and I'm firing back you know all these scriptures coming blessed those that have not seen yet believe one God ah, boom 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 I'm firing back at him and then so he's like listen he's like you really blowing my mind and in the meantime, it's like these six people behind me waiting, standing there for the altar call. So I'm thinking. I said, you know, I was a little nervous at first. I said, just Brother War and I, I said, but God and you are always the majority. I said, Brother War, I said, you take the altar call here. I said, and I'm going to keep these five or six. And we had a simultaneous altar call going two lines. And it was beautiful. And then me and me, Brother War was ministering to him and then he said to me he said Wilson is violent he's throw he likes to throw chairs and attack the staff but he was locked in on me and he said how you know God's invisible he said God's invisible how you know he said I got locked up because he said I pray only when I'm in trouble he said he said just like I'm locked up now he said they would, the law, he said, the police was chasing me. I jumped through an alley. I threw the gun here. I threw my dope here. And I said, oh, God, please don't let them find it. <laughs> he said, he said, you know what, brother? He said, he said, you know what? He said, they didn't find the gun or the dope. I said, well, how are you here? He said, I had some in my pocket. <laughs> and I looked at him. Pray for wisdom. Pray, yeah. I said, Wilson. Now he's got me, I'm throwing these scriptures at him. He's got me out. He said, so how you know he's in, I only prayed to him. He said, I don't want to be this way. Jackpot. Come on. I said, I looked at him. I said, okay. I said, I said, I said, Wilson. He said, how do I know it's invisible? You know, I said, I said, you breathing? Because now I'm throwing these scriptures at him and I see it's going over his head. So I got to readjust. I said, are you breathing? And him and his friends looked around. He said, yeah. I said, how you know? He said, because of the air. I said, can you see the air? That's God moving. He looked at me. He said, he said, now you got my attention. He got everybody shut up. And now it's like all 10, 15 of them surrounding me. And I'm looking for Brother Ward like, you know, where you at, brother? You know, I know I don't see the line back here. Where you at? 
And then so I'm, 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 we go in the town with him, and then so, and then so Brother Ward stepped in there, and it was awesome. And he looked at me. He said, when are you coming back? He said, we need you to come back. We need you to come back. And I really remember we've been praying. I said, a month is not enough. Once a month's not enough. And, and there had been this one individual when we had our revival services out there. And he caused a lot of trouble based on our beliefs. One God, baptism in Jesus' name, really tried to discredit us. But it turned out it, it hurt him. And I remember Pastor having this conversation with the chaplain. And the chaplain's really pro uh, Judaism and into the Jewish culture. And, and pastors said, you know, the first, the scripture that they believe in is Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Yeah. And the chaplain kind of connected with that. And then so in between the services, the chaplain looked at me and he said, we, we, we began to talk. And I began to poke at him about the baptism service because we got about 10 folks that want to be baptized in their family. And I'm like, we got to get this don't going. So I'm poking at him about it. And he said, he said, you know, Brother Williams, he said, I used to be like that guy that attacked y'all 30 years ago. And I said, really? And he said, but back in, now watch, catch what I'm saying here. He said, back in 1985, he said, I went to a tent revival for a week long. I said, really? He said, this guy, he was apostolic. Not sure if he was related to y'all or whatever. I said, well, that's what we are. You know, our fellowship is not a pen. I said, but we're apostolic. Make no mistake. You ain't got that yet? You know? And he said, no, well, I'm not sure. He said, but back in 1985, he said, I went to a week-long revival. He said, I was a stone-cold Southern Baptist Trinitarian. And he used that term, and now I'm, I'm li really listening. And he said, back in 1985, I went to a week-long revival. I took my wife. I was pastor in a church, he said, and it was this guy there. He said, he could preach. He said his name was Urshan. Come on. 1985. A forefather of our faith. It's sowing seed. I'm 10 years old in 1985. We meet 33 years later in a prison. And he's giving, he's our most staunch advocate. And he says, I was in there. I went as a stone cold Trinitarian. He said that by the weekend, he said, I was not. I walked out of there, he said, no more, I was not. And he looked at me, he said, brother, I, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I don't mean to impose on you all. He said, but I want y'all out there weekly. Yeah. Yeah. Weekly. <laughs> now, I see, now I see, to, to, what's the day? The 30th. And I knew God was doing some things and getting ready to move us into a new dimension with this ministry. And he says, Weekly. I said, that's what we've been praying for. He said, I didn't want to overbear y'all. I said, you ain't. I said, just come on, just get whatever you got. He says, well, I need you to minister to the staff. We're doing the music thing in their studio. We're going to use a, that as a medium to minister to them in that way, the core preaching and teaching of the word. We are going to have revival. We are going to turn IYC upside down with the doctrine and truth of the one true God, the living Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Praise God. I got it. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you for praying. I, I, he told me that yesterday, and I just, I was on the phone. I said, you tell me any more. I said, everything else but my bones is going to be fat. Because they were all, the Bible says, a good report, make it the bones fat. I said, my goodness, I'm, I'm already loosening my, my bone belt. That's incredible, folks. He was, Brother Urshan was the general superintendent of the organization while Brother Yance was in headquarters all 17 years. So they were, their, their offices, I think, were next door to each other. Uh, you know, I, I'd go up and see my father-in-law, and Brother Urshan was right next door. Hi. You know, you, you always want to do something by the door, you know. 
But it was, it was an incredible place. It's where, it's, where, it's where revival was coordinated around the world. And uh, what, what a great place. And when he said that, when I looked at him, I looked at Chaplin last time. And he, he came to me and he said, you know, there's been a little disturbance. I already knew that. Because we had heard uh, uh, connections, communications through, uh, through Tim, uh, who was there doing worship uh, the, week, the, the month before. <clears throat> anyway, he, uh, I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, he said, uh, it's kind of causing trouble amongst the volunteers. And I said, well, sir, we are, we are not here to cause trouble, but we are here to preach truth. And I said, and I, I mean, he, he goes over to Israel. He's been there three or four times. He talks about the, the Hebrew word, <clears throat> the, the Hebrew language. He talks about their customs. And I went after that. I said, I know how you love the Jews. And I said, you know, Jesus was a Jew. He stared at me. And I said, and you know, when he was asked what the most important scripture is in the word of God, I said, he quoted, he, he quoted Deuteronomy 6.4. He said, yes. <laughs> he, he just didn't commit, but this time he committed, and I wasn't there. But uh, it's exciting what God is doing. God is opening a door for revival. God has done all of this. He's done all of this, and when we baptize those kids, I believe they'll all get the Holy Ghost in the, in the tank. I believe they all will. <clears throat> Would you mind standing with me as we go to the Word of God? Again, it's so great to have our cousins here. Uh, one of the, I think the first time I met Cousin Leah was uh, when we were at the Courtney Revival. Uh, Sister Yance's brother was named Courtney because of that. Uh, not, because of the, uh, not because of the reunion, but because of the family. And uh, I remember when I, when, I left that, uh, when I left that reunion, uh, Jim Simonson, who was at one time the general, the district superintendent of Indiana, uh, Uncle Jim, they called him. Uh, he was he was quite feeble at that time, but his mind was sharp and his anointing was powerful. And I I, I crawled up on my knees next to him. He was in the chair, and I said, Uncle Jim, would you please pray for me before I leave? And I'm telling you, his eyes sparkled. Uh, and uh, he laid his hands on my head, and he prayed in the power of God. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed, and, and it's what he lived for. And uh, it, it was just, I'll never be the same. I'll never forget those times Brother Kilgore laid hands on me. Those precious men of God, that era, are, uh, they are now gone, but their anointing is still here, and the doctrine is still here, and the Holy Ghost is still here, and we're excited. Psalms chapter 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. In verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I want to preach on the subject today. When the music stops, does your song continue? When the music stops, does your song continue? Jesus, touch our lives, touch our hearts. Open our spirit, Lord, to your power of your spirit. I pray for your anointing. We thank you for the worship that has gone on before God, drawing your presence and glory into this house. But Lord, now through your word and through your spirit, would you minister to us? Would you put things in our heart that only the power of the word and the power of the spirit can do? Religion can never do for me and never did for me what I needed done in my life. But a few moments in your presence took care of everything I was looking for. Bless the word to our lives, we pray, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. The Bible says that they wept when they remembered Zion. 
Many times we think about what used to be and we are disappointed that it's not that way still. And they were thinking about the past and the glory, Solomon's temple, the glory of, uh, uh, of the temple, the gold, the, the ivory, the linen, all of the articles, the silver and the gold and the brass that were there. And it says that, that they remembered Zion and they, they, they wept. They, they hanged their harps upon the willow. We read the story recently. It came up in one of the messages regarding, um, regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angels came in and they said, Lot, you need to tell your family, you need to tell them to get out of the city because judgment is coming to the city. And they went around and they told their family and eventually uh, nobody responded. Nobody responded to, to the alert of judgment. And the angels came and they said, Lot, we have got to get out of this place right now because judgment is coming. And Lot took his wife and his two girls and ran out of that city. And on the way out of that city, one of the stipulations was that you don't turn around and look back. And I know that the Bible talks about us, anyone that, that turns around, you know, when you've got your hand to the plow and you turn around, he said, you're not fit for the kingdom. Now, you think that's pretty strong, but God said, I don't, I'm going to spare your life. But there are some stipulations in the sparing of your life. And one of them in this situation was, don't look back. And we find out that his wife did turn around and look back. And we heard and read that the Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt. She lost her life because of it. And she turned. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why she turned around and looked back. I can imagine that it's a few things. Probably family members wondering, are they going to make it out? But also one of the things that we turn around and look back at is when God gives us a promise for the future and we turn around and we look back, God looks at us and he says, don't you trust me more about your future than what the world can offer you for your past? Don't you think I have a better future for you than the world can give you a past? The things that we used to be in need to be dim compared to what God is going to bring to us. If our desire it lays only in the past, then God can't give us a future. If we're not excited about heaven, then God says, you're not excited enough about me because heaven is not about things. Heaven is about, it's about his presence and his power. But they, they wept for the past, our past is never supposed to be more desirable than our future. All the way it used to be. I used to be young. I used to be fast. I used to be good looking. I used to have money, you know. You start thinking about all the things you used to do and, and you reminisce. And God reminded me, when I read that scripture, he said, yeah, but what about where you're going? What about the future? Do you feel that the greatest revival has already hit the Bartlett community? Or do you feel like it's still coming? Now, we rejoice about what happened at the prison yesterday. But I'm looking forward to what's going to happen at the prison next time. And the next time. I believe this thing is exploding in our midst. There are circumstances that cause them to put away their instruments. There are things in this life that will distract you and they will cause you to put away your song. You'll be distracted. You'll look at the clouds of doom and you'll forget about the promises of heaven and the promises of the miraculous, the promises of God's salvation to your family. But there are things in this life that will cause us to put away our song. Their captives asked them to sing. When I looked at the word, it said, um, they that wasted us required of us mirth. It means gladness. They said, we captured you, and now we want you to sing. We want you to bring us gladness. They were still looking, even though they won the battle. 
They were still looking for gladness. And they knew that somehow the Jews had it. There was something that the Jews possessed that they wanted. And it was more than just land and, and gold and silver. They said, we want you to sing for us. And it reminded me of the prison when that young man, Carwell, he said, sing. And he startled me. It's when people are captive. It's amazing how they can look at you and look at me and say, I've got things that I want and I've got power and I'm the leader of a gang, but I want you to sing. You look like there's something, like there's a song inside of you that I don't have inside of me. I may have money and I may have power and I might have possessions, but I don't have a song and I know you've got one. And they turned around and they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange place? Sing for us, Jew. Sing for us, Israelite. It's as if they were saying, did you bring your singing with you? And their response was, we're not used to singing outside of Jerusalem. They said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're not used to singing outside of Jerusalem. We sing because there are things going on in ceremonies and traditions that we have to follow. And now you've captured us outside of that. And now we're not comfortable. We can't, may I, may I maybe reiterate it this way. We can't sing because we're not in the right place. Is our song supposed to be at 270 East Schick Road? Is our song supposed to be inside concrete walls of this church? Or is our song supposed to go with us wherever we go so that when the lost ask us, sing for us, we can bring the power of God to them through worship. They associated their Lord's song with a place instead of a person. We can get so crossways with God, with what God really wants to bring in our life. This is not about a building. This is not about a denomination. This is about a person. This is not about a place. This is about a person. This is not about a promise. This is about a person. God developed us and gave us a voice so that we could sing. He said, shout unto the Lord with all, all ye lands and bring the glory unto God. He said, clap your hands, O ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We've got to stop associating the Lord's song with just a place. Israel in Babylon lost their song. Their circumstances dictated their song. Do we allow our circumstances, conflict, offense, finance, job positions that didn't come to us, do we associate all of that with our song when all of that is going well? Look at the glory of Solomon, gone. The glory of Solomon's temple, gone. The test of a song. Was all of our song attached to the glory of Solomon's temple? Was it all attached to things going well? It's easy to sing when the band is playing. It's easy to sing when your health is good. It's easy to sing when there's money in the bank. It's easy to sing when your family is together and they're all saved. But when somebody's lost, when somebody's addicted, when somebody <clears throat> is in the hospital, when there's no money in the checkbook, it's hard to sing. There needs to be a song at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. My praise shall be about him. The humble shall see and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. For I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all. When the music stops, does your song continue? God intended to put a song in our hearts. He intended for our hearts to sing at all times. 
He wants something to be inside of us that is not about a building and it's not about did I get what I want. It's about do I have a relationship with him. That's what this is all about. He didn't go to the cross so that we could have money in the bank. He didn't go to the cross so that everything could be going well for us. He went to the cross so he could have a relationship with you and with me. He wants to put a song in your heart. Why would be we be satisfied with anything less than a song? Joshua chapter 15 tells a story about a promise of someone's daughter. Caleb said, if somebody will win victory over Kurjith Sefer, he said, I will give my daughter Othniel to whoever has that victory. And of course, Othniel... He said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Caleb's daughter was given to Othniel because Othniel was the one who won victory. He won it just like David won victory and was given the daughter of Saul. It was a custom of those days. And, and when he gave the daughter, all of a sudden the daughter turned around and said, Dad, you've given us the Southland, but I'm not satisfied with that. She said, give me springs of water. Notice she didn't ask for wells. She asked for springs of water because water is life. If you don't have water in the desert, you die. And she said, I understand I can have water for a day out of a well, but wells can go dry. I need something like a spring that is bubbling up that I'll know that no matter when I go, it will be there bubbling with water. Wells can also be filled by the enemy. And did many times the, the, the Philistines came by and took all of Jacob's wells and, and Isaac's wells and filled them with rock and with mud. The Bible says it filled them with earth. It says, the, it says uh, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. These are the wells the enemy will try to fill up your well. He'll, the, the things that you draw the water of life from, he'll try to fill them up with distraction. He'll fill them up with disappointments. He'll fill them up with the things of this world. But God is saying what you need, you need something more than just a well. You need a spring. You need something that's bubbling and under pressure. It amazed me when I read about in John chapter 4, it says, Jesus was there, and he said, I must needs go through Samaria. And in John chapter 4, it says, now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus was sitting on the well when the woman of Samaria came by. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour, which was noon. Or, yes, it was noon. It was as if, if we look at Jesus sitting there, and Jesus is sitting on the well. The wells were from the previous generation. And then you have Jesus sitting there, and a woman comes to draw from the previous generation. It was, this thought came to my mind. It was as if the Old Testament and the New Testament were there together. Jesus was saying, you can draw from this well. And what did he say? He said, or you can draw from my well. He said, I'm going to give you a choice. You can have the Old Testament laws of tradition and ceremony, or there's a new well that you can have. I'm giving you a choice. You can have the law, or you can have life. The Bible says, let her kill it. But the Spirit giveth life. And then in verse 14, Jesus said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him. Notice this, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. I looked that up. I, I, I always talked about well springing up. And every translation and commentator that I looked at, I said, God, what is that really? Why did they say springing up? Because it wasn't just a well. It was a spring that was bubbling up. You notice a well seeks a level. Okay, you draw down a well in your home and it will work its way up. It seeks a level. It doesn't come splashing out. It doesn't come bubbling out. But a spring, 
a spring. You, you, you uncap a spring and it will overflow and bubble out. You don't draw out of a well. You kind of capture it because it's flowing out all over. Jesus said, the well that I have, I'll put inside of you. It will be a well springing up. It'll be a spring, not just a well, but a spring springing up unto everlasting life. If we want water out of a well, we have to either draw it out or pump it out. Spring is under pressure. I looked it up. It says, I, I, I typed in Google and I said, why or what causes a spring to bubble out? And it, it says, it's from an aquifer underneath that has either been directed or it's flowing too fast, too much water is going into it, and so it's under pressure, and it has to find a place to come out. So it is under pressure. Water stoppers in our lives, when Jesus puts this well springing up unto everlasting life inside of our hearts, there are things that can still stop that up. They can, they can turn the faucet off, so to speak. They are immoral things. Videos, magazines, songs, music, books, internet, friends. Wow, it got quiet. I'm talking about a well springing up unto everlasting life. Everybody's jumping up and down. I say, yeah, things can shut that off. Have you ever seen somebody receive the Holy Ghost for the first time and they're just bubbling, just bubbling? I remember when Anthony Lacasho came and got the Holy Ghost. Oh, my goodness. I was praying next to him and praying with him. And, and I'm telling you, the glory of God came over him. And it hit him so hard, he stood straight up. He was kneeling at the altar and had his hands raised. And he shot up and he stood up and he, and he was speaking in tongues and he fell straight back speaking in tongues, and the glory of God was all over his face. He was smiling. He was like, oh, my goodness. And then the, that weekend, he went and got drunk. And he came into church. The, he, that following weekend, he, he got drunk. It was Friday night. And then he came to church on Sunday. He was like, uh-oh, something happened. I went over to him, and I said, how you doing? He said, not so good, not so good. I said, what happened? He said, we got drunk Friday night. I said, okay. I said, now let's talk about the power of the blood. And I prayed with him, and all of a sudden that bubble, that bubbling started happening, and that, that glow and that smile came upon his face again. Why? Because it's a well springing up unto everlasting life. It's not meant for a one-time experience. It's meant to keep letting it bubble up. <clears throat> if something stops the well, you need to take that cover off. What's stopping my well? What's stopping that spring from overflowing? Whatever it is, get it out of the way. Let that spring water start bubbling up out of your heart. The Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communication. First time I read that, I said, well, as long as I don't swear, I'm good. Because, you know, evil communication, that's the way the King James interprets it. But evil communication, it doesn't mean speak only. It means associations. Evil associations will corrupt good morals. That's how it's properly translated. Evil associations corrupt good morals oh okay that means who i hang around if i allow them to influence me it can corrupt it can stop my bubbling spring yes it can and if it's not bubbling just look who's sitting next to you no i'm just kidding i don't want to that's found in first corinthians 15 but we have to be careful I remember when my kids used to come home and if they ever came home and they had a really bad attitude, I would mark it down in my head, where were they? Who were they with? And if that happened two or three times, you're not going over there anymore. Why? Because every time you come home, you're difficult to deal with. Because, you know, and then I would quote that to them. I'd say, evil communication corrupts good. No, I didn't say that. I said, you are allowing the influence of the people that you're hanging with to influence your attitude and your spirit. We all, it doesn't matter. This is not just for eight-year-olds. 
<clears throat> this is for all of us. If we hang around people that are constantly influencing our good morals, it will change who you are and it will stop that spring water from flowing out of your spirit. It will, if it has stopped, that's why people say, well, Pastor, man, I, I, I've lost my love. I, I don't know if I love God anymore. I don't know if I love the truth anymore. I, don't, I, I seem to have lost, lost the joy. I'll go right down the list. Who are you hanging around? Are you hanging around somebody that you, that, that, that you didn't used to hang around? Are you reading something? Are you looking at, are you watching movies you're not supposed to be watching? Are you looking on the internet at things? Are you, are you getting close? Are you going to classes that are talking about humanism and, and materialism and, and human philosophy? Is that, what are you doing? What are you doing to cause that shift? Because you st- whatever you're doing now, you weren't doing before because it was bubbling before. And it's not bubbling anymore. So something between then and now has changed. Just look at what it is and start figuring that out. Get rid of that. Take that out of the well and let it come bubbling up, and it will. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth. God, what do I say when I'm not standing in the church building? What what do I think? the meditations of my heart. What do I think about when I'm not in the church? What what do I talk about when I'm not in the church? Is it something that is pleasing unto God or not? Philippians 4, 8 says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. Talk about those things. Proverbs 23 says, as a man thinketh, in his heart. So is he. If we allow, you know, Pastor Yance always said, you know, you can, you can let the, 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 you know, the birds are going to fly overhead, but you don't have to let them make a nest in your hair. And the first time he said that, I said, that sounds wise, but I'm not really sure what that means. And he said, you know, the geese are flying, you know, you can see them hundreds of feet up in the air and there's nothing you can do about it. But if they land on your head, you could do a lot about that, okay? And that's what he was saying, and the Word of God teaches that. It says there, there, things will come in, into your life. They, they will come through your life at some point, but you don't have to let them get close. You can say, I can't do anything about that, but I can do something about this. If somebody starts talking in your ear, you can say, too close. You're building a nest in my hair. Too close. You can, you can go by. It's fine. Nice to see you. Good. But I'm not going to let you get that close. You're starting to affect my thinking. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I don't want to be like that. I, I want to be like God. I want to be pure. I want to be honest. I want to be a man of integrity. That's what I want to do. So God, let me think on these things because that's how I will be. I wrote this down this morning. Gossip. Gossip is one of the perils of spectatorship. Oh, you can write that. I, I penned that. So you can write that down. Give me all the credit for it. Send me all the royalties. It seems that the people that do all the gossiping are the ones that aren't doing anything. They're, all, they're, they're the most critical. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I wonder if they're afraid to do something because they're afraid of somebody else telling them that they're not doing it right. I don't know. But, it, but you, 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 we, we were at the house talking last night. And my wife said, Honey, come in here and tell, tell Cousin Leah about the, uh, the prison stuff that's going on. And I talked to her briefly about, uh, about how we got in and what happened miraculously in some of these services that we're doing. And then I found out that she was in prison ministry for 30 years. Was that 30 years. Yeah, she's an assistant chaplain, co-chaplain. Yeah. And so when I got done, she said something that, I mean, we were sharing testimonies and she was telling me about all these things that were happening and I was telling her about all these great things that are happening. And when I got done, Leah looked at me and she said, thank you for sharing that. And I thought, you, you, you talked way more testimonies than I did. She said, you helped me remember all the things that God did through my ministry. And, and, and I thought, no, the, 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 the lowest level of conversation is about people. The next level is about things. But the highest level 
is about ideas. We start sharing ideas. How did you get in? And how can I do this? And you start sharing ideas about the kingdom of God. That is the highest level. When you talk about people, that's the lowest level. But when you talk to people about ideas, when we get together in fellowship, let's talk to people about God and about the kingdom because that's what makes a difference. And that's what will lift people up. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves. What that means is me first. It's a selfishness. It says that they'll be covetous. What does that mean? I looked it up. It means possess something belonging to someone else. I want to have something that belongs to somebody else. It says that they'll be unthankful. And then it says that they'll be unholy. But it says unthankful first. So once you get unthankful, the next step is unholy. So God, help me always to be thankful for what you're doing in my life, what you've done for me, what you've given me. Thank you for what you've done. It says there'll be truce breakers and traitors, which means there'll be no loyalty. And it says having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, from such turn away meaning godliness is only a form. It's not the real thing. See, holiness is supposed to be part of us. Holiness is supposed to be who we are. We are supposed to be holy. He said, be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. It's not supposed to be something that, that, it's not supposed to be a jacket we put on and then take it off when we leave church. It's supposed to be part of who we are. Not just a form, not just a custom, but it's supposed to be something real inside of us. Soldiers, Moses, the Bible says that he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses, basically second in charge over all of Egypt. I mean, talk about a cush life. He didn't have to worry about food, didn't have to worry about money in the bank, didn't have to worry about prestige, didn't have to worry about position. All he had to do was get up in the morning. That's all he had to do. And everything was done for him. A life of pleasure. And yet it came, one day he woke up and he said, I am a Hebrew. I am making a decision today. I will always be a Hebrew. It's easy to say that, but much more difficult to do. We can say that I'm going to be a Christian, but it's going to be much harder to actually do that. But Moses decided that he would forsake all of Egypt just to be what God wanted him to be. Abraham forsook home and family. God said, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Now I want you to leave your people. Abraham turned and walked away. Where do you want me to go, God? Just start walking. Just leave. Leave this city. Leave this people, and I will make of you a great nation. Esther her uncle came to her and said, Esther, they are plotting to kill all of the Jews, and if you don't do something, God will raise up somebody from somewhere else. And she said, all right, I'm going to fast, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice. I'm going to endanger my own life for the lives of others. But these people were soldiers. They were people that decided, I still have a song. I'm doing this out of more than just tradition. I am doing this not because of duty only. I'm doing this out of desire for God. I'm doing this because I love him. Not just because I love what God has done for me, but because I love him. This is about me and him. Sacrifice. We know what Moses did, and we know what Abraham did, and we know what Esther did. But the Bible goes on to say in Hebrews, it says, they, they. Who's they? The nameless? They subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness, which speaks of works. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the enemy. It talks about them being sawn asunder. It talks about them being pulled apart. It talks about them being fed to the lions. and The gladiators just beat them to death. And they did it all with a song. See, life isn't going to always be about a bed of roses. 
It's going to be about, do you really believe this? Is this part of who you are? Or is it just something, is, is it maybe a bridge to get you to heaven? I don't want just a bridge to get to heaven. I want to see him. I want to love him. I want to worship him. I want to worship him for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I want to thank him for all that he's done. Is this about relationship or is it about religion? Hebrews 12 says, lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. There are things that stop the spring from flowing. Weight talks about the little things, the attitudes. It's the foxes that spoil the vine. Just the little things of every day we can allow to creep into our life and we can say, oh God, I, I know I'm supposed to pray today, but you know, I'll hit it again tomorrow. And little things in life can cause us to be tripped up and say, God, I know I, 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 sh- I, I should have. And we get away from the things that are important to us. But when we have a relationship with him, there is a desire inside of us that says, when, I get out, when, I, when my feet hit the floor, the first thing I'm going to do is find my, my knees on the floor. I'm going to find my place of prayer, which is in my recliner, in my office at home. Every morning, it's the first place I go. God, I want to talk. It's quiet in the house. Nobody's awake. It's just me. I'm going down there and I'm going to pray and I'm going to talk to you. Not because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a saint of God. I want to stay saved. I want to stay in a relationship with him. I don't ever want to lose what I have. I don't want the foxes to come and destroy the vine. I'm going to pray every day. It says besetting sin. He said, lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. When I looked up beset, It means it's a competitor. It's a competitor hindering from every direction. That's what besetting sin is. It's a competitor. This little sin is competing for your attention. It's competing for your relationship. It's competing for your passion and for your desire. It's competing for your time. It's competing for what's important to you. And it's competing from every direction. That's what it means. It's coming at you from every direction. And God is saying, when all this stuff happens in your life, do you still have a song? When all this comes at you, will you still find a place of prayer? Will you still lift up your hands and say, oh God, let that spring begin to flow in me again today because nothing in this world is going to take away my relationship with you. Nothing. Notice the story of Achan. And I'm closing. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 19, Joshua came to Achan Israel had begun to experience defeat. And he said, Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make a confession unto him and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And the Bible says he couldn't. He just hung his head in sorrow. See, God is asking you today, Give glory unto the Lord. Let your song be sung. And there's times in our lives where we say, I don't feel like singing. And, and, And I would sing if God would answer my prayer the way that I've expected him to. But God's not going to answer your prayer most of the time how you're expecting it to be answered. But we still need to walk into the house of God. And when someone says, oh, let's worship the Lord, you say, yes, I will. I will worship him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not because of what happened yesterday but because of who he is today when the music stopped Achan couldn't sing the song his song was based on things going right not on who God was you see Achan disobeyed God he robbed God and then he covered it up we need a song in our heart This world is so evil. And without a song in our heart, the world will strip you of anything that you have going with God if you don't have a relationship with him. God needs to put a song in your heart. It needs to go beyond duty. It needs to be done willingly. Have you ever been walking through the halls of your house on a Monday 
on a Tuesday. I love it when my wife turns her iPhone on and plays a Christian station through Pandora and all these worship songs are coming through the Bluetooth speaker and filling my house with worship. And I, I'm telling you, it, it, it happens for about 10 seconds and all of a sudden, You start whistling, you start singing, and it's not a Sunday, and it's not a Wednesday, it's a, a, it's a Monday, and walking through the house, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, you start singing, pops used to do that all the time, he would walk through my house, and he would just start kicking his heel, he would say, oh. Jesus, Jesus. And he'd just start singing and walk through the house and he would bounce my kids on his lap and he would sing, Jesus, Jesus. He'd start singing to him, And my kids are, you know, bouncing all over the place. And, and, but they're hearing the songs of God. You know what happened? It wasn't a church. It was, it was a song in his heart. And he didn't have a very good voice, but he had a song that he could sing. <clears throat> Pastor Yance lost two children at a very young age, and he still kept singing. He still kept loving the Lord. He still kept giving God all glory. He had Linda's wedding dress hanging in his office, and every time he'd open up that closet door, he would stand there by himself and sit there and weep and weep and weep and then walk away and say, thank you, Jesus, for letting her be saved before she gave her last breath. Thank you, Jesus, for the years that you gave. See, instead of wishing for something to be different, thank you, Jesus, for what you gave us. Thank you for what you... There's a song in our heart that goes beyond circumstance. It goes beyond obstacles. It soars above the clouds. It soars, it soars over the mountaintops because a song in our heart goes farther than any horrible circumstance. Acts chapter 5, verse 40 it says, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And then the Bible goes on to say they rejoiced. They rejoiced that they were allowed to suffer for his namesake. They rejoiced. The enemy beat them, and they walk away singing. They walk away singing. Paul and Silas get beaten and thrown into the lower parts of the dungeon. They're all locked up. No, no light going in down there. And they're, they're standing next to each other and like, hey, Silas. Yeah, Paul, what's up? Hey, I got a song coming. Go ahead, man, I'll follow. You want me to sing tenor or alto? Just sing. And they start singing and they start worshiping down in the depths of the, jo- uh, uh, of the jail, of the prison. They start singing and the walls begin to shake and the, the doors open and all of the prisoners get to go free and their shackles fall off their hand. Why? Because the song wasn't attached to good times. Good times are attached to songs. When they started to sing, that's when the shackles came off. That's when the doors opened up. Sing first. Let the song erupt in your heart and let the prison bars begin to open up. Revelation 15 says, I saw those that had gotten victory over the beast. They had gotten victory. And in verse 3, it says, and they sing the song of Moses. Who? Those that had gotten victory, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. They just kept worshiping. They had a song in their heart. They just began to sing. They just began to sing. They just kept singing. They sing and the victory happens. You know, when they, when they took Jericho, they walked around the city with complete silence. And then it was time to rejoice. He said, it's time to shout. Shout what? Challenges at the enemy? No, just shout. 
Just shout unto God. Let's all shout together. And when they did, the walls began to come down because there's something important. Singing and shouting comes before the victory. But when you sing, when you've got a song in your heart, all the walls can come down. All the mountains can be removed. Would you stand with me this morning? This world has changed their morals to the extent that people that died just 20 years ago would not recognize this country. Why? Because perilous times have come. See, we that have been alive the last 20 years, you watch it happen day by day. You see the change and you don't really notice that contrasting change. But if you closed your eyes for 20 years and then you open them, you'd say, What in the world is going on here? This world is in trouble, folks. We need a song. There are those that want to take us captive, but they're asking for a song. Do you have a song? Is there something inside your heart that's going to carry you through the next devastating event? Is there a song that will sustain you through the loss of a loved one? Is there a song that will carry you through financial devastation? An addicted child, an addicted spouse, a spouse that rejects you and walks away. Is there a song inside? Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit that they which believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He was saying, there's coming a day in your life that you're gonna be thirsty. And you you need to allow me to put inside of you this well springing up unto everlasting life because this world will do everything it can to stop the water from flowing in your life. That's why I don't want to just give you water. I wanna put it inside you so that no matter where no matter whether you're in the lower depths of a prison you can still open up that spring and say come on Jesus let that spring flow inside of me Jesus is here today he's here this morning if you've never experienced that river of living water there is a thirsting inside of you you've looked at relationships you've tried the things that this world has, the drugs, the alcohol. You've tried money. Nothing seems to satisfy. It's because there is a river of living water that Jesus is just waiting. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I'm giving it to everyone who is willing to receive it. And he's saying today, if you're thirsty, if you're saying life up to this point has not satisfied, There is a river. There is a river. Mm. Mm. There's a river. There is a river that flows from deep within. There is a valley. Mm. Mm. Jesus, you are offering today a river that will finally satisfy the seeking heart Is there anybody in this place that is looking to finally satisfy that thirsting in your soul? Has the enemy possibly stopped up your well? They've distracted you with with, with critical complications, caused you to keep your eyes upon something else and you forgot to keep your eyes upon him. I invite you today to come to the altar If you don't know what's going on, but yet there's still something missing, I ask you to come. We won't embarrass you. We're just asking you to come and let Jesus talk to you. Let Jesus touch you. I want you to feel his presence like I did the first time I walked into a church like this. It was absolutely overwhelming emotionally. I began to weep and cry in his presence because I knew that I was 
getting ready to taste something that would finally satisfy the thirsting in my soul. It's for you and it's for me. Would you like a song today? Would you like to walk out of here with a song in your heart? I ask you to come. Look at your neighbor and say, let's go up and get a drink. Let's go get a drink. Let's go get a drink from the well. Oh, Jesus, flow through us this morning. I pray that somebody would have, that their desire would overcome their fear. Fear of the unknown. God, fear of unfamiliarity. But allow their desire to overcome that. God and step up here and say, God, I want you, I give you permission to touch me. I give you permission, Lord. I give you permission to touch my heart. I'm listening for you to talk to me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and worship. Hallelujah. If you're thirsty, I promise you he'll give you a drink from his river this morning. Jesus. What a beautiful name. 